Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I always say it's like f trying to follow Leanne um, when you're all chatting now, which I totally get because it does. The whole idea is to stimulate, and I'd love to have a conversation with you during the lunch. That'd be great. Um, because I know it is difficult out there. Absolutely, really difficult. So my name is Joy Tickle. I'm the Tissue Viability Specialist in Shropshire, not too far away, but a couple of hours. Um, I don't know if any of you have met me before, but I've been doing this job for about 24 years. Absolutely love it. Um, nursing for 35 years this year, so don't look past the cement, the concealer, the MAC and the everything else. Um, that is my name. I didn't make it up. I don't star in the carry-on films, although I could, being called Nurse Tickle, but it goes a long way. Um, just feel really passionate about tissue viability and hopefully that will come across. Particularly around, yes, this discussion around self-care and uh, other solutions. Hence why Leanne, a good few, Leanne and I, a good few years ago, start and wrote that pathway. So I'm going to do a slightly different angle and looking at one of the solutions that Al and R have introduced, which is the um, Exudate Management Solution. Um, so during that, throughout that pathway, you have got separate solutions, and I'm going to talk to you about Exudate Management. Um, we are going to do some voting as well, if that's okay. Um, it's very anonymised, and it just helps to facilitate discussion. I'm going to look at the biggest challenge and the challenge of, of managing highly exuding wounds with patients with venous leg ulcers. So we're still going down that pathway of VLUs. I'm going to look at exudate and how to respond to that and, and take away some of the myths and truths around what is exudate and then share some of the patient stories with you that by implementing the pathway and the solutions um, throughout the pathway, how it can help or assist you. So if you don't mind voting for me, um, I know the writing's suddenly gone smaller and I think that's just a sign of my age because I do apologise when glasses go on, glasses go off. Uh, jacket can't come off, but it would normally, um, and the hot flushes would take over. Hence the air scraped back because I look like, um, do you remember crystal tips? See, I'm showing my age now, well I'd look like her. So anyway, are you voting? Choosing the correct dish... Dressing is the biggest wound care challenge. Debridement, surrounding skin, managing that. Exudate, odour or another reason. Now, we didn't put all of them because I know they can all be a challenge. But we're just asking you personally and professionally, what's your biggest wound care challenge? Just so, again, we can stimulate some discussion around that. And you know what? That doesn't surprise me at all. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Every roadshow I've done... Uh, so far this year, that choosing the correct dressing has come out on top, okay? Um, and debridement, yes, exudate and some of the others. I'm not saying that the others aren't a challenge. So why do you think choosing the right dressing is a biggest challenge to you guys in practice? I find that there's so many dresses. Yeah. There's just a plethora of masses of different dressings, isn't it? And that can cause total confusion when you say, what dressing am I going to use for this patient's wound? Because that's what you're doing. I know it's very easy when you're on a ward, you're only limited, because it could be the opposite. You're limited to what you can use rather than you have too many choices to what to use. And again, you're so busy trying to know what each one of those dressings do, but which is important to their mode of action. It's hard, isn't it, to, to establish that. What, what other problems do you think, then, choosing the right dressing? I think choice is one of them, or too much or too little. Anything else? Location of the wound. Yeah, so I don't know who said that. Sorry, I'm looking. Yeah, location of the wound, really good point, because, you know, you may have several dressings, but is it the right one for the location of the wound? But what I will say to you, and I'll, I'll, I haven't got much time, because... As Liam finishes on time and is normally really quick, I'm the opposite. I tend to talk a lot, so I will finish for your lunch. The thing with dressings, though, is they will not, they don't heal the wound. They facilitate wound healing or wound debriding or wound cleansing. It's the whole holistic approach that heals the patient's wound. So I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on you. On, I'm not picking on you I'm, I'm in a nice way. So if you say to me, Joy, you're hopeless, you've been using that dressing and you haven't healed my wound, I will reverse it and say, I'm not going to heal your wound, you are, okay? 
I will help to facilitate it with choosing an appropriate dressing or cleansing agent, etc. But as long as you continue to uh, drink those two bottles of wine every night and smoke 40 cigarettes, sorry, um, and smoke that wacky backy, then your body is not going to heal your wound as quickly. See where we're coming from? Because they will blame you guys. They will say it's your fault. It's not. Dressings manage signs and symptoms of a wound, whether that be devitalised slough, uh, whether that be high levels of exudate. And yes, it's important we know our dressings, our mode of action and an appropriate wear time because that then helps to facilitate. But I totally get that. I really, really do. Um, and I, I can see that equally debridement and exudate, but they all come in hand in hand, don't they? If we have high levels of exudate um, or high levels of slough, exudate increases. If we exudate increases and in slough, we have increased risk of infection. Then surrounding skin can become damaged and then it's difficult to know what to use. So I'm not going to harp on about the leg of the pathway. Leanne's very eloquently explained how the pathway came about. She didn't tell you we actually wrote it on a serviette post-conference with a glass of wine in our hand but I'll share that because we were totally confused on which way to go and we sat there and said well if we're confused and we work in this field every day we need to help we need to put something in that's a lot um, beneficial to you on the ground so but what I want to emphasize is those um, added solutions the debridement the exudate and the self-care solutions that have been added to our pathway by Eleanor and you've got copies of that you can visit the stand you can go on their website and have a little look a little bit more around that and the one of the most important to me is also that prevention and maintenance so you go through all these solutions but we really want to maintain that prevention and maintenance so what I'm going to concentrate on today is high levels of exudate management or exudate management per se. I love the topic of exudate, I really do. I, I love exudate per se. I wish we could do scratch and sniff in the audience, you know, where you get those little scratch things and you can sniff exudate and you can feel it because it tells you an awful lot about the patient's wound and condition. Okay, so if you could vote for me, guys, how confident do you feel about managing patients with high, we're talking high levels of exudate, very confident, fairly, not very confident, or no confidence at all. And I really do appreciate we're all at different levels of, of experience. Um, you know, some of you, I, I didn't see this slide, unfortunately, about who you were and where you were from, but I'm sure students, you know, again, I don't know how much you have on your curriculum for wound care. We have very little in Shropshire. Um, so again, this will vary with your experience, I'm sure. So let's have a little look at the outcome of that. Yep. And again, um, you know, linking into what Leanne was saying earlier on, some of you are fairly confident and that's good and that I think will come with your level of experience and how much you are exposed to wound care. Some of you may not see very many patients with wounds, some of you might. And overall not very confident and I think exudate management, it is for me, it always, always has been for me, one of those biggest challenges I think and if we get this right I think a lot of the others follow suit. So hopefully at the end of my presentation I could hopefully uh, help you with being a little bit more confident or even more. So what is exudate? We perceive exudate as a bad guy, don't we? If you imagine ex high levels of exudate now, I bet you are picturing somebody with a wet weeping leg that's causing excoriation. Um, my, one of my ladies I saw not long ago uh, went home to and she sat with both legs in a washing up bowl, separate one, um, because her legs were leaking. And I'm sure you've seen worse. I have patients who come to clinic who think um, they've done really well to wrap their legs in a towel, a plastic bag around it and get to clinic without it leaking. I had a patient who, and I've told this story last year as well, and it always, always sits with me, that came into, my, uh, into one of my clinics crying, never met me before and said, I am not coming here again. Now I know I've got one of those faces, but she was mortified and I took her into a room she come on voluntary transport, a little town, so you know what it's like, everybody knows everybody. Came in, uh, got out of the cab, she got a leg ulcer, first, first um, visit with ourselves. And the voluntary driver said, excuse me love, as she got out of the back of the car, I think you've wet yourself. Now she hadn't, but the leakage from the back of her leg onto the leather seat, he could see it and he assumed she'd been incontinent. 
Can you imagine? I can't even imagine that. If that was you, or if it was your mum, or your sister, or somebody you know, or your best friend. And she hadn't, but you can, she couldn't even speak to this man, and she was mortified because it's a town, isn't it? She, it's going to be around that she's wet herself in the back of a, a car. I went out to the, to the driver, and they have to sign confidentiality agreements anyway, and said, look, you, you're totally wrong. That isn't what you, you're perceiving. I didn't go into detail. I wiped the back of the seat for him, went back in and reassured, and told him, obviously, about confidentiality, and then reassured the lady. But you can understand why patients become isolated, can't you? Even if they're mobile, even if they can get out, they're not going to go out. Patients refuse to go in supermarkets because of wet, weeping legs and out in restaurants because of what? But fluid is the good guy. Exudate is a good guy. Without exudate, guys, your, your, not your wounds, well, your wounds if you've got one, but your patient's wounds wouldn't heal. We do not want a dry wound bed. We want that exudate. It's really important. It's going to bring with it loads of essential nutrients, proteins, uh, carbohydrates for energy, all those nutrients we call we require for wound healing and repair it's going to bring waters and electrolytes guess how you know initial wound healing exudate levels during the inflammatory phase will increase why do you think that is because it's sending lots of white blood cells antibodies to fight any infection or devitalize tissue there so it needs exudate it needs the transportation to bathe the wound and facilitate the fluid over that wound bed it's really really important um, it will increase during the inflammatory phase and it'll increase during the proliferation when we're getting new buds and cells growing because it needs to to uh, take the cells to the area for reproduction okay so bearing that in mind it's got growth factors it's got inactive proteins or proteases and that's essential for wound healing I know we know about harmful proteases, but I'm talking about the good guys here. We really, really um, need exudates. Um, as I've just said, it's providing a medium, a transportation for essential cells to migrate around the wound. What are cells mostly made up of? Fluid. How are they transported? Fluid. So again, it's really essential. So when you look at your patient and you look holistically, and I know you do, you, you address nutrition and you look at muscle scores. How many of you ask the patient to keep a fluid score or a fluid balance? Because if the patients, they might be having three fabulous meals a day or protein supplements or whatever, but if they're not taking the right amount of fluid in, how can this process occur? So again, dehydration is, is important to address there. As I've said, it's bringing essential cells for metabolism. It's enabling those really essential growth factors to diffuse along the wound bed as well. And it promotes autolysis. And by that, you know when you have a sluffy wound or, you know, that, that exudate, uh, sorry, uh, that necrotic tissue, that exudate is going to help to promote autolysis or the body's own way of breaking down that sluffy devitalised tissue. If you've ever seen a wound that's got that sluffy tissue that's been allowed to dry out, you have that thick leathery escar, don't you, that is difficult to remove. So we require the exudate to facilitate autolysis. But some wounds are prone to more high levels of exudate okay, than others, particularly chronic leg ulcers. Chronicity and exudate. Exudate and chronic wounds is different, guys. It will contain more active proteases that are called on for MMPs, and they can destroy essential proteins that we require, and it can also then destroy tissue. It can cause that wound to become higher levels of, inflammatory, uh, of inflammation. So do you hear it when we, I've often say wounds are stuck? They're not moving on. They're stuck in that inflammatory phase. Again, this type of exudate as well, because let's remember, exudate contains waste products as well. It's going to contain dead white blood cells that have been sent to that wound bed to help to fight any infection or potential infection. It's going to contain waste products. The waste products are not clear fluid. It contains irritants, enzymes, and if that exudate then comes in long-term contact with the skin or the wound bed, it's corrosive. And you've seen that, haven't you, when you see that very excoriated red skin. Um, and that's not because the exudate is the bad guy, it's just doing what it's doing. It's just been left too long on the peri-wound skin or the surrounding skin and the wound bed itself. 
Okay, so it can be very, very harmful. And I'm sure that's the bit we remember, isn't it? That's the bit I remember when I'm picturing a patient's leg now with a heavily exuding, is that, or sometimes it's that waterlogged effect where it's like it's become, well, the, the, the cells and the tissue have become waterlogged because the fluid's sitting next to that skin. And it's a bit like when you've been in the bath too long, not that I have that luxury, um, but it is, it's that waterlogging effect. So we really need to address that. But what common factors are there? We, I do believe in not just looking at exudate itself, what is causing it? Because if you can find the cause of high levels of exudate, guess what? We can treat it appropriately, can't we? So what do you think? What are some common factors that make exudate increase? Infection. Infection, definitely. So that raised um, bacteria or microorganisms, it doesn't just have to be bacteria, it can be viral, it can be fungi, especially around feet and other areas and groins and under breasts. So it could be that increase in those microorganisms, definitely, because you, guess what? Your body's going to send more white blood cells, more macrophages and phagocytes to fight that, which means it will increase the level of exudate. So it's natural, okay? What else will increase exudate levels, a cause? So yes, so we need to treat that, don't we? We need to look at addressing that. What else? Gravity, brilliant. Gravity, yeah. How many of your patients? I go to bed, go to bed every night, and you see the bed pristinely made every day with the whatever still sat on top of it and all the rest. Um, and you know they're not going to bed, okay? But gravity. I think it's. I think it gets to the point where they become so swollen that if they try and elevate, they're painful just from a pressure point of view. They're heavy, so they feel uncomfortable. Um, and yeah, and I think sometimes it's it's that knock-on effects that's made them sit with their legs down. Now, some patients, I believe, will, will sleep in a chair or, or stay in a chair because of other comorbidities, such as respiratory disease, heart failure. You know, my mum was the same. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm not saying that's easy, guys, because I've got patients like that now, and we have to still keep educating them about the risk factors of... Because as long as they... You know, you could put them... You could follow this beautiful pathway and put them in, uh, you know, bandaging or wraps or hosiery, but if we don't address... or I know it's difficult, but if they don't address that other factor, which is gravity, um, you know, then, then it will be an ongoing problem, isn't it? And it is, again, putting that ownership and empowering those patients, which is easy, I know, easier said than done. But yeah, definitely um, non-viable tissue. So that sloughy tissue, as I've just said, exudate levels will increase. The body's naturally going to try and autolytically debride that, so we know that's going to happen. So if we can remove that devitalised tissue or slough quickly, the exudate levels will start to decrease, Okay edema which we've just said so it could be either edema because generally they're suffering with edema so that could be venous disease general edema lymphedema we have to correct that in order to reduce the exudate level so all these factors as you can see are important infection and biofilms my colleague said that over there yeah i mean if there's infections and biofilms present exudate levels will increase it's the body's natural way of trying to cleanse the wound bed take essential nutrients and um, um, what I'm trying to say antibodies to try and fight that infection as well the size of the wound the depth and the location because obviously a circumferential leg ulcer may produce more exudate than a smaller leg ulcer because we're just talking leg ulcers at the moment guys okay I'm not on about other wounds so yeah the size of the wound okay gravity my colleague said down here one of the most common reasons why limbs produce more exudate okay and even if your patients are chair bound let's say I hate that word but say they can't mobilize um, simple foot exercises if they can do them so bear this in mind, but simple foot, just dorsiflexing, plantar flexing, round the clock face, you're pumping the blood back up to the heart. And people think, oh, that's not going to help. It actually really does, guys. And it helps to stop things like fixed, ankle, uh, fixed ankles and other problems. Subtherapeutic compression. So I've put patients in what we call reduced compression, but how long for and why? Okay, and we'll get on to that in a minute, but so if, if a patient requires full therapeutic compression, get them into it as soon as possible. Now, if pain is the issue, 
we need to address the pain first then, don't we? Work with your, your GPs or whoever to get the patient more comfortable so that that reduced compression can go straight up to full compression. Because, you know, and how long do, you know, do we keep patients in that subtherapeutic compression? I've seen some patients that have been reduced compression for about 12 months. And it is, time does fly, I know that, but you've got to set that goals and, and set the goals with the patient. You will, you know, in two weeks' time, when you're more comfortable, hopefully, we will be taking this to full compression and explaining why. And again, comorbidities, guys. There's certain comorbidities that, that may uh, predispose your patients to higher levels of exudate. So, you know, congestive cardiac failure, respiratory disease, all those other factors. I'm not saying that you can treat those. You're probably far better at treating those conditions than I am. But what I'm saying is you have to work as the MDT team to try and improve those conditions for the patient, if, if possible, because that will then help them long term with their exudate levels. To me, though, on my soapbox and what, why I, I like lecturing about exudate, I like writing about exudate, I love... I'm that person, I know I'm really sad, that gets... I go in, in, in out with community nurses, I go into patients' homes, I go into practices, I go into community hospitals, and the nurses are really lovely. They always try and help because they know I'm rushing in. There's only four in our team. Um, but I'm the one who then puts my gloves on and delves in the yellow bag. And they look at me like I'm a bit sick because I want to see the outer dressing, the secondary dressing. I want to smell it. I want to look at it. I want to look at the exudate colour. I want to look at the viscosity. I want to, want to feel the weight of that dressing, knowing how long it's been on, because that's going to tell me a big, big picture on... on the, the, the um, level of exudate, but also what factors, those other common factors might be linking to that. That's why I went into tissue viability. I love to scratch, pick, squeeze. Anybody else? Yeah? No? Yeah, just me. I love Dr. Pimple Popper. Any of you been watching that? That's great. But anyway, that's just before your lunch. But joking apart, though, it can tell us such a lot, guys. So look at it. Okay, look at that exudate. Your patients, teach them. My patients tell me so much before I've even looked at the wound. Oh, there's more of that fluid coming off or that exudate, uh, or it's more fluffy. They call it instead of sloughy. But I love it when they're tr using terminology that we've been telling them. There's more smell today, Joy. It's more painful today, Joy. They're, they're, it's their wound, you know? Get them involved. They can tell you so much. These are not my words. These are case studies from l &R, individual patient stories, and these are their words, and this is the bit that, that resides with me. Obviously embarrassed about fluid leaking onto wounds. I like that picture, but I want you to imagine somebody 18 now, because my youngest patient with a VLU is 18. And why do you think we sit... And you're going to see... I may retire in a few years, but some of you guys are going to see this younger generation coming up with problems in their venous system. Why is that? Lifestyle. So what is different in their lifestyle then? What, sorry? Weight. Yeah, we see more increase in the bariatric and obese patient. Sedatory, lack of exercise... The guy I see had a DVT from sitting cross legs playing a game station for many, many hours. He now has venous disease for life. Do you tell your patients they've got a disease for life with venous disease? You need to. You tell them if you've got diabetes, don't you, or hypertension. Venous disease is for life. It's a disease in the arteries. It, no, it's not. It's a disease in the veins, even. But it's there. It's for life. So when they think, oh, I won't need to wear these anymore because it feels... They have a disease. Start on day one, guys, and tell them this is for life. So that boy has that disease for life. Okay. Um, yes, people wear baggy clothes, black. Lots of ladies say I wear black all the time because if it leaks, they can't see it as much on black clothing. Would you like to wear black all the time? I didn't think I could make it to my daughter's wedding because her legs were leaking so much and so heavy. I can't imagine that, not making your daughter's wedding. Um, not worn real shoes for 12 months. I mean, I love my heels. I can't, I can't go back on the train in heels. My flatties come out. But if I'm going out somewhere, I like to wear a shoe. Okay. This lady wasn't housebound in the sense she wasn't mobile, but she became housebound because her legs were so heavy she couldn't walk to the clinic. So again, we're making these people dependent. This lady was refused admission to a local supermarket. I can't imagine that, you know, because of the wet dressings and the odour. 
and dressings had to be applied more frequently, okay, increase in pain. But also, what's that to the patient Leanne talked about? Patients do love to see you. I, I was a district nurse before I was tissue viability, and patients do love seeing you, okay, but we have to sort of try and put ownership back on them. I know it's easier said than done. Um, and when I was a district nurse, for people to say, oh, what a lovely job. You get to see the patients in their own home, and I bet you can go home at, the, at lunchtime and peg your washing out. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm from Stoke and did say a few words differently after that. Um, so, what I'm going to concentrate on is how can I give you a solution to egg shed then? How can we remove some of those barriers that cause that egg shed to increase? Three, sim three simple steps, guys, okay? What we're going to look at is if we look at an egg shed solution, that then can hopefully, if we reduce those high levels of egg shed because if they're really high, chances are you're going to be bandaging, okay? Um, and what we want to aim for is a little bit more towards the self-care or certainly team dynamics of a good skill mix where you're not reliant on the RGN just doing the dressings because why shouldn't your assistant practitioners, healthcare assistants be actively involved in this? Mine are and I think it's the best way to go or the patient themselves. But we have to get that exudate down, that exudate levels down though, don't we, in order to facilitate that, that um, self-care. Eleanor introduced a really simple three-step method. R is for remove the reason. I'm going to go through each one with you. And again, you can visit the stand. They've got lots of documentation supporting this. Um, go on their online platform as well. Removing that devitalized tissue or potential infection or biofilms. If we remove it, we reduce the bacterial microorganism burden we reduce the amount of exudate that's being produced. Because exudate, remember, is the good guy. It's going to facilitate autolysis. Okay? So if we get that wound bed much more cleaner, less slough, that exudate will start to reduce. So that's your remove. But then we want to absorb that exudate, don't we? we? We don't want to dry the wound out, but we want to get the moisture level right, the moisture balance. We don't want a dry wound, but we don't want a wet wound. We've got to get the moisture balance, but in highly exuding wounds, you really need to think about having a super absorbent for those highly exuding wounds. And what that will do then, of course, is absorb the excess exudate away from the wound bed um, and reduce that microorganisms again. And then finally, compress to heal. Without compression and improving the venous return, improving venous return reduces edema. Improving venous return means more oxygenation, good nutrients to the wound bed, and waste products removed. And so it's remove, absorb, and compress. Well, I like things really simple, so I remember that because I call it the RAC, the rescue for the wound, okay? So RAC, and when I see a patient now, I automatically think remove, absorb, and compress. What am I doing for that patient with a VLU that's heavily exuding? Just said to you about removing the barriers. How do you debride your wounds, guys? We all... Show of hands who debrides wounds in this audience. Yep. Yeah. Okay, at the end of today, I'd honestly say you're all debriding wounds. Okay, debriding wounds is to remove that devitalised tissue, remove any biofilms. And I, I can't talk about biofilms today because it's another subject, but please look up biofilms and go on to, to the website to learn about them. But they, they are, it is that extra polymeric substance around bacteria and microorganisms that's a hard shell. And you all have them on your teeth this morning, okay? And you'll all have them on your teeth when, so you do that now, and you probably felt them. So did you just get your toothpaste and rub, rub it around your mouth? If you did, I don't want to know, okay? And I'll avoid you at lunchtime. No, what did you do with your toothbrush? You did that. Why did you do that? Because the dentist told you, yeah? But you are breaking down that hard shell that's protecting all those microorganisms. And then your antimicrobial toothpaste could do its job. And tonight, you'll do the same again, hopefully, okay? Because the biofilm is reforming. It's just the same in a wound. Chronic wounds, the majority of chronic wounds will have a biofilm. You can't see it. Okay, and if you put a an anti nice antimicrobial dressing on, or just a dressing, can it get through that? If your, patient, if your patient's antibodies are saying there's devitalised tissue there, I'm going to send the white blood cells to kill some of that bacteria, can it get through? No, 
I then give you some antibiotics for a bit of goodwill. Can they do their work? No, because you can't penetrate it. You have to penetrate it for them. And the best way is to debride the wound, okay? Now, there's lots of methods of debridement. Your wound dressings can debride. There's maggots. There's all sorts. I love maggots, okay? But do, are they available? What about your skill mix? Any of you use the Debrisoft, the monofilament pads, or the lollies? Yeah? It's, it's, it's not a dressing. I have seen it stuck on a wound. Wrong way round. Not by a nurse or a clinician, by the patient who said, I never touched it. Mm, let me have a think about that one. Um, it's a monofilament pad. Thousands of little monofilaments. Feels really soft. When I first saw it, I thought, mm, debridement, fantastic way of just removing devitalised tissue. Okay, Dry skin, devitalised tissue, bacteria, all those. And you can see a wound bed really clean in a matter of minutes. Do you need to be an RGN to do that? Okay. Can your patient do that? Of course you can. I see children. If I go towards a child with a little bag of maggots, you probably like them actually, um, or blades, but if I'm getting my dressing ready, or my whatever ready, and I say to my patient, there you go, show them how to use it, you debride your own wound. Not only is that giving them ownership back and saying you're allowed, it's your leg, you, you debride it. They're t starting to become engaged and empowered about caring for their own wound and you can be getting on with other things and you talk around that other uh, area, okay? The evidence is out there, guys. It's not Joy Tickle standing up here. Everything Leanne taught and I talked to you about is the evidence. Nice have endorsed the, the, the Debris Soft. The evidence is there. So then we need to absorb. I broke down that devitalised tissue. I broke down the slough. I broke down the biofilms. I may have put a primary dressing on. I now want to absorb, because we're talking exudate, the excessive exudate. How many of you have superabsorbance on your formula? Yeah? Some of you might not know if you've got a superabsorbance on your formula. Put, just be brave and tell me, do, do you know if you've got a superabsorbance? Say, if you don't know, can you put your hand up for me? You're just being chickens now, because I know there's probably more of it. Yeah, but thank you for your honesty. Because... You need a superabsorbent on your, your formery, whatever formery it is, because if you've got high levels of exudate, standard absorbent dressings and foam dressings, no disrespect, are not going to manage those high levels of exudates. And that's when you'll start to see things, what I call the splat attack, whereas the exudate sits and just splatters out around the wound bed. Superabsorbents are there for a reason, okay? They need to be conformable, but how they work is they will absorb the exudate, whether it's thick viscosity or thin, they should absorb both, okay, back into the dressing and lock it. They've got to be able to lock it in because it's a bit like a baby's nappy. It locks in the fluid, the excessive fluid, and stops it then causing that excoriation and maceration to the skin or the wound itself. Because remember, guys, if that exudate sits on the wound bed, it's going to make that wound bed become bigger and deeper because it's the, it's the harmful proteases in there um, that are going to become a problem. So we use in our community, but what I ask you to do now is go out and find out which one is your superabsorbent on your formery. Because when you've got highly exuding wounds, you should be using it. And then step down. When the exudate starts to decrease, it's called a step up, step down approach. But just make sure it's effective under compression because we're talking VLUs. It's nice, you know, this, you'd think, how can that absorb high amounts of exudate? But it's the makeup of it, it's the mode of action, okay? And also it's conformable and comfortable, um, which again, so we've then done the absorb and then, of course, compress. Without compression, guys, when we're talking about venous leg ulcers, and I mean full therapeutic compression, you know, it's going to be a slow or uneventful process of getting that wound or venous disease. I hope I don't see a venous leg ulcer. I, if I see a, a patient with a venous skin change, straight away I'm talking about compression. I don't want them to present to me with a wound, okay? I'm that person who lies on a, a sun lounger at the side of the pool looking at everybody's legs and going, I think he needs a bit of varicose vein surgery. And my other half going, oh, for goodness sake. I follow people in, around in the supermarket. You're all, you bet you're glad I don't live in Bristol, don't you? Follow them around and look, because they're your next patients, aren't they? How many of you in this audience, show of hands, wears compression when you're at work? Good, but not many, okay? We, we in this audience are at high risk. 
Okay, guys, we're on our feet all the time, as Leanne said, with the most malnourished, dehydrated workforce in the UK. Okay, look after yourself, guys. I can guarantee there is quite a high proportion of you in this audience that either already have venous disease or you're at risk of developing. So you'll all be there at the l &R stand now, going, I want my stockings and all the rest of it. But please, guys, you're our next patients, okay? With that three-step approach, that three-step solution I call the RAC, let's just show you how it works. This is one organisation. It's not my organisation. It's not far from me, but they just did a four-week trial of putting in that RAC, um, the, the absorb, um, remove, absorb, and compress. And they saw a 45% reduction in pain scores. Now, that to me is the most important thing for me because a patient in pain, we might call them non-concordant, non-compliant, troublemakers, whatever. But if I was in pain, maybe I'd be that, that person. So, but just having the reduction in pain from doing those three simple solutions, wound size reduced in all of the patient's wounds, and it improves their quality of life. This, this is written up. This is evident out there, and you can ask the guys for copies of that. What does that equally mean, though? As Leanne said, I'm not going to keep harping on. Um, a reduction in clinicians, not just nurses' visits, and saving money. And I know we all have to save money, but for me, it's the improvement for the patient. Then, less time for you guys having to visit that patient. Because like you say, we don't sit back drinking cups of tea and all the rest of it. We, you know, you have got so many other things you need to be dealing with with your patients. Um, so every moment does matter. It really does matter. I know Leanne's mentioned that. Um, and I think it's important that I know I'm talking to the converted in this audience. And I thank you for that because you're here because you want to make a difference. You are already making a difference in your practice, but you want to make a bigger difference. And I know you've got challenges, and that's why I'm looking at you guys on the front row. Um, challenges from clinicians who say you're not to do it that way. Okay, challenges because things aren't available to you, like a hosiery kit or a, leg, um, a ready wrap or a wrap system. All I can say is use the evidence. Yes, you could go and say there's this person named Joy Tickle with a big mouth who said this, but use the evidence to say, well, if that Venus Force study back in 2014 showed that we could have just as good healing outcomes in a hosiery kit as bandaging, why aren't we doing it? They won't like it. But you've got a challenge, and I think if you are struggling, the national strategy will bring this all in. And it won't be a case of having, you'll have a choice, but you know what I mean. It'll be pushed that way through the organisation. Um, sorry. Sh If I had that answer, I'd be a millionaire um, But what I would say is, um, is it that... So I'm visualising your patient now. No compression at all. Won't wear compression. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, they've got, um, got patients that have got tubes of edema. Yeah. Um, you can't even... Right. Is that because they refuse the bandaging or have we offered wrap system or a hosiery? Because I've got some patients who refuse bandaging, full stop. Even if they've got a heavily exuding wound, I've still put them in a wrap system. Yes, which I totally respect that. I don't think it's easy, and I think the only way is to try with the patient. I mean, what I try and do is if it's not the patient that's saying no, it's the organisation, I get the patient to be the voice and say, I actually want to try those. 
I've got a right to try those. Um, the Leg Also Matters campaign, any of you signed up to that? Just get your patients to sign up to it. It's a, it's a platform for not just clinicians, it gives you loads of good tools. It's called Leg Ulcers Matter Campaign. It's a national strategy, it's non-profit making, it's about eight different organisations come together, but it gives you vo your patients a voice. And it's a patient platform on there I love, and it, it's that that makes some patients say, well, why haven't I got that? Or, and I know some patients won't, some patients, you know. All I can say is we have to be that advocate. We have to say, well, yes, she, she, we're going in every day and we're putting these bandages on or not, as the case may be, because they may say, don't put the bandages on, it costs too much. Well, what are we going to do? You know, okay, well, let me put some wraps on with super absorbents and change it every day initially till we get that down. And I bet you that'll cost a damn sight less and be more comfortable for the patients. The wrap systems will go all the way up to the thigh. We use our wrap systems on patients with lymphedema as well. So again, but if they're not listening to you, get as much evidence, the nice guidance, the best practice guidance and say, Venus 4, massive RCT, why are we not following this guidance? And I'm not saying it's easy, okay, because I still have some patients that I'm struggling with. Um, thank you for asking that. I just want to share two, two little case studies now with you. This is a gentleman, 49, and we do visualise that patient with a venous leg also being in their 80s and their 70s, don't we? Because, yes, the elderly are more predisposed. But the elderly didn't always start with that venous disease at 80. They probably started at 30, post-pregnancy, post-children. That's the women, not the men. Could be interesting. But what I'm saying is, take these years off these patients because they're the patients of venous disease. Presented to the GP, had a trauma wound, been going backwards and forwards for five weeks. Um, wounds increased in size, it's really painful, it's heavily exuding. He has got a history of hypertension, he's got, um, and he is overweight. He's fully mobile though, he's working full time as a lorry driver, and he's had a vas holistic assessment and a vascular assessment that says he has venous disease, which you can see on the image the hemosidrine staining. He wouldn't know that. He wouldn't, he's had that probably for years, but he wouldn't have recognised that as venous disease. That's why I'm saying the, that's why we need to start recognising this or giving our patients advice of what to look out for. So by putting in the three-step solution, so R is removed. Now you might look at that and think, well, there isn't much devitalised tissue there. It looks quite granulating, doesn't it? Nice red granulation tissue. So why do you think it's slow to heal if we're looking at tissue? What else can um, be formed over that that's stopping a biofilm, yeah. So we need to break down any potential biofilms and remove any slough. And we did that with the monofilament pads, with the Debris Soft pads. Did I do it? No. Did he do it? Yes, whilst the nurse was getting everything else ready. Okay? Encourage them. Okay? So then you look at absorb. It's heavily exuding. So what are we going to go down the pathway of, guys? You may put a primary dressing on, you may have had an antimicrobial if you thought there was biofilms present for two weeks or not, just as a, a simple dressing, but a super absorbent because nothing else is going to manage that highly uh, exuding wound. Okay, so think of your super absorbent so that's your absorb to remove. Okay, if you remove the high levels of exudate, you're going to decrease the microorganisms, you're going to make it more comfortable for the patient, who will hopefully be more concordant with the treatment. But then we've got to compress. Okay, so you use your pathway, and yes, it says highly exuding, large wounds use bandaging. But when we said this to him, he was like, I don't want bandaging. I have to drive, I have to wear safety boots, I take, I, you know, it's impeding on my life. And we say to him, well, just for two weeks, just till we get your exudate levels down, and we'll put you into a self-care plan. He was happy then, because he knew it wasn't long-term. Okay. Now, if he hadn't, then maybe, maybe I would have definitely gone down the route of wraps. But the pathway, he went into bandaging for two weeks. Okay. When he then went out of bandaging, uh, once the exudate levels had decreased and the edema to the limb had decreased, and he then went into uh, hosiery kit. That was after just four weeks. Was he going to the practice three times a week for that to be done? No. Once a week, and he was doing it in between himself.
okay because it meant that you could work longer hours you could change it when it was painful you could change it if you thought it was leaking but you didn't really need to because it was improving but we still use that RAC the remove absorb and compress system so that's just four weeks but he didn't remain in bandaging we then followed the pathway for the self-care he then didn't need superabsorbance because guess why the age of eight levels decrease so don't use it if you don't need it and finally this patient elderly female patient uh, history of venous disease, extensive leg ulcer on the outer aspect, present for eight months. Can you imagine having a wound for eight days, <coughs> let alone eight months, and the impact on her life? Uh, in reduced compression due to pain, okay, but for eight months. Exit eight levels were high, moderate to high, and she had a good ABPI, and she's got some restricted mobility. So just thinking again, remove. That was after one use of the monofilament pad, the picture before, the picture after. Now, yes, there's some blood loss on there. It's not unhealthy, though. But can you see how much that slough and devitalised tissue has been removed? Can you imagine how cosmetically, for her, she, she prefers that? Okay. That was in, what, four minutes? She could do that herself, or if not, you could do it, or etc. She went into compression bandaging for a short period, and then into a hosiery kit. Um, now, I haven't got the after picture, but can you see the difference of offering choices as well and your skill mix within your team? Okay. Any questions from those case studies? No? You want your lunch now, don't you? I can tell. Any questions at all about what we've talked about? These were just a couple of others, but I've just... Uh, final question then is, how confident are you now at managing high levels of exudate, even if you just put in that simple solution? I know it will depend on what's available to you, um, but if, if you could then look at a patient now, in, imagine at your patient you see tomorrow with a heavily exuding wound, how a little bit, hopefully, more confident might you feel? If you all put not, I'm going home. Okay, brilliant. Well, I'm smiling. Hopefully you're smiling. It's still some not very confident, but please, I'm staying around for lunch. Come and talk to me. If there's any tools we can offer you, you know, to help support with that. Um, but I'm glad to see that most of you now are very or fairly confident. Thank you very much. Thank you.